from what I understand, the human body hasn't become more resilient over time. Like if you take a human being from the fifth century AD and you looked at us now, like we would essentially have the same lifespan. The difference is medicine is not mm. as good. There was more people dying from famine. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was more prevalent. Right. Um, but essentially, if you could put those two people in a vacuum in different time frames, we'd live this, about the same time. Yeah, yeah. It's mainly, I mean, the big uh, advance uh, around 100 years ago was sanitation. Okay. I yeah. mean, most people just got, you know, a lot of bugs in their system and eventually it, you know, killed them. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and that was 100, and I think in 1890s, stomach problems, which was just a generic term, was the main re reason people died. Nobody died of cancer. I mean, almost nobody died of cancer because they were dead already. You know, before right. they got it, right. uh, people didn't die of heart attacks until the 50s and 60s, you know, because they were already dying before that. And a lot of times it was just sanitation or a lot of times it was childbirth. One out of five right. uh, children died of, in childbirth in 1900. So once we started getting just good sanitation, more people lived longer. And then sulfa drugs and penicillin and those sorts of things. I mean, people would routinely die from typhus or scarlet fever or, you know, even, I don't know, just a sore throat. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know, a bad cough. <laughs> yeah, and we just get out of hand, you know, and uh, and now, you know, all those drugs keep, keep people alive now. And then statins came along and, uh, you know, all sorts of other drugs that are extending life. But one of the things I discovered in, with Immortality Inc. was people were living longer but not necessarily better. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you see a lot of people in their 80s, and they're just yeah. struggling, yeah. you know, or even in their 90s. But no one's living a great life up to 100, you know, uh, and dementia starts to kick in almost universally by 90, you know. So mm -hmm. it's just, uh, I mean, you always find good stories of people that, you know, are 100 years old and smoking cigarettes and drinking and yeah. they're, they're just fine. But um, one of the things we discovered in the course of the book was those are people that mainly don't have very many bad genes. That's ultimately what gets you. Bad genes. Bad genes. Yeah, like if you have a heart issue, your vascular system is going to break down at some point. Everybody has, nobody has perfect genes, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but those people that have something closer to perfect genes are the ones that live the longest. Interesting. So at some point, no matter how much you work out, no matter how great, you know, your, uh, your diet, eventually your genes are going to get you. Mm. So that's where the work that Art Levinson and Calico is doing, yeah. you know, where he's basically trying to figure out what are the switches that get flipped in, uh, you know, in, in our DNA that make us actually age. You know, there's something going on that says it's time to age. It's time to start breaking down. Otherwise, we just rebuild our bodies. We, we're perfectly capable of it. Right. So yeah. that's where stem cell ther therapy and that sort of thing can help extend life. What do people like Art Levinson or Ray Kurzweil, what, what do they say as far as like a timeline to when we're going to be able to extend our lives significantly? And how long, and, and not only like when in the future do they think that will happen, but how much longer do they think they're going to be able to make humans live? Oh, okay, great questions. Um, well, Kurzweil always has very specific numbers, mm. uh, you know, for everything that he's predicted, and often he's quite right or very close. Um, he pretty much believes that by the late 2020s, we will have created enough advances in, and he predicted this in 2000, uh, enough advances biologically that we can begin to extend life longer, you know, basically extend life for every year you're alive, you would be able to extend life another year. So, okay, so you could be able to stay stagnant. Yeah, yeah, you can keep yourself going and keep yourself going kind of at that level of health, whatever it and is. And we'll get there in the late 2020s, he thinks? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and I think that sounds pretty accurate. Uh, and then uh, he believes that in the early 2030s, what will kick in is nanotechnology. So basically, you can have molecular-sized machines that are obviously invisible, and they're just mechanical versions of biology. So they go in and clean out your heart, you know, or 
or go in and augment your brain, uh, you know, suddenly you just, you know, with the flick of a switch, you're in another world because you have nanotechnology in your brain that's just creating that world. Mm. So they're artificial neurons, artificial uh, cells, you know, that can do mm -hmm. anything your body can do except better. Uh, and then that really begins to reverse aging, you know, so that you can actually get younger, uh, not simply continue to stay alive. And, uh, and then once that happens, you know, you could basically live forever. And I think Aubrey de Grey calculated at one point you would probably live a thousand years uh, and then something would get you. You'd get hit by lightning or by a bus or something you know. that it's just so yeah, catastrophic random, you can't come back from it. Yeah, some random event was eaten by a shark. Yeah, right, right. Some random event's going to happen. Yeah, but won't those people be able to at some point upload their brain to a chip or to a to a flash drive? And if their body gets eaten by a shark, they'll just they'll have a backup. They'll be able to just plug it into a cyborg yeah, or something. Yeah, well, and that's exactly the premise of Doppelganger. Okay, uh, that is precisely that, and and that. The concept or the, the, the kernel of that story goes way back to a meeting that I had with a guy named Hans Moravec at Carnegie Mellon. And he was the head of uh, Carnegie Mellon's Robotics Institute. And he, was the first, he wrote a couple of really interesting books. One of them was called Mind Children. And, uh, hmm. and he was the first scientist to say we could download a human, a human brain into uh, a machine, a robot was the way he, because he was a roboticist. roboticist. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I remember when I read that, I went, whoa, you know, well, and then I thought, well, what if this guy, you know, uploads or downloads his brain on Friday and he's murdered on Sunday? And then you create, you give him his backup and his backup is from Friday. So when he wakes up on Tuesday, he thinks it's Friday. And he doesn't know that he was murdered. Right. And then, but he would want to know once he finds out who killed him. And uh, that's the underlying premise of Doppelganger. And it, you know, basically buys into the concept that someday we will be able to, you know, completely download a copy of yourself. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> and, uh, and that, of course, creates all sorts of other possibilities because mm -hmm. then you can make doubles of yourself. Right, and then versions of yourself could go off and do things, and then come back and put it all together in one brain. I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, uh, ways that it could go. Oh yeah, that gets scary. That yeah. gets scary quick. I mean, mm -hmm. What's to stop tyrannical dictators from just duplicating themselves a thousand times and spreading themselves all over the world? Right, right. Yeah, there are certain people. I think we can all agree we don't want to have right. one of them. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> oh my God, that's terrifying, man. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the reason, one of the reasons that I fa was fascinated by this, and there's really documentaries that got me into science. I was, I was an English major, you know. So, one of the things that got me into it was, you know, there's philosophy and there's history and, you know, everybody has an opinion, basically, when it comes to those kinds of things, when it comes to the human, human behavior and, 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 and human culture. But science at least has a shot at truly understanding how things work, you know, and if uh, if we can get a handle on it, then you know. So so we're creating these powerful AIs. They could help us solve those problems. There are some wonderful things that artificial intelligence can do, uh, and there are in, in, you know incredible technologies we've created that can solve a lot of problems. But you know, we have to be very careful because I mean, just take nuclear power. You know, everything's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. Every technology going back to the first knife is literally a double-edged sword. Right. You know, so do you want to kill someone with that knife or do you want to use it to, you know, have some meat so that you can survive? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I just think it's all fascinating and we really are coming to a time in, in human culture where a lot of these problems, big problems can be solved, but they can also be incredibly dangerous. So what are we going to do?